Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Younger. I'm a permanent fellow at the IWM, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here this afternoon to hear from Konstantina Kinja speaking on All Quiet on the Culture Front, the Russo-Ukrainian War and the Weaponization of Culture. Konstantina is really one of the world's leading curators, art journalists, historians, and indeed investigator of art frauds, which is a very interesting subject in its own right. And Konstantin has been one of the curators of a truly extraordinary exhibition of modernism in Ukraine that premiered um, last, late last year in Madrid, now is in Cologne, and which we will have the great delight of having here at Belvedere in the spring of 2024. So this is a chance to sort of look ahead to what is coming. But while we do that, and while we think back to what Ukrainian art and what art in Ukraine looked like a century ago, we also can't help but think about the ways in which culture is intimately implicated in the genocidal violence that we are seeing in Ukraine today. And in that regard, Konstantin, I think you are somebody who has thought more than almost anyone else about the cultural and intellectual implications of both sides of this war, of Russian aggression as well as Ukrainian defense and resilience. And so I wanted to ask you to start our conversation today as you've been observing this over the past two years, and indeed over the past 10 years and even more, what do you think we all have overlooked? What is your key to understanding the role that culture is playing in the midst of this destruction? Uh, it's a very interesting question. And to be uh, honest, I have a feeling of, uh, let's say, syndrome of sleepwalking. Uh, European leaders and the European public proved to be sleepwalkers. Uh, Russian uh, educated classes proved to be sleepwalkers. And despite the um, uh, burning letters were on the wall, nobody, practically nobody, except, let's say, Ukrainians, uh, some East Europeans like Poles, Baltic states wanted to see them. And when they were reminded about them, they said, no, no, no. Uh, which uh, became a prelude to this war and really became absolutely visible since the very beginning of it. Uh, we have to return to the old definition of Max Frisch, culture as alibi. Uh, and Russians really used culture as alibi. They started to use it way before this war started. In the beginning of the war, Ukrainian intellectuals uh, started uh, campaign trying to, uh, let's say, boycott Russian culture. I have to say that this campaign had an element, and still has, an element of excessive zealotry. But uh, in any case, we can understand the emotion when Ukrainian cities are bombed every day when Ukrainian cultural monuments are ruined every week, this zealotry could be understood. Again, I told you that sometimes it has parodic elements like uh, renaming of streets when the, I don't know, Dostoevsky Street in Kyiv is renamed after Andy Warhol, which is a key. But when the uh, Leo Tolstoy Street in the city of Hust is re renamed after Boris Johnson, despite of all heroic deeds of Boris Johnson, it's a bit too much. Uh, the same as when um, uh, Theodore Dreiser Street in Kiev is becoming Ronald Reagan Street, which will not make happy every American Democrat. But this is the Ukrainian side, and I'm here not to talk about Ukrainian side, because maybe it's not a ripe time to discuss this problem. We have a big problem in front of us, which is a Russian problem. Uh, and what is happening today, to my understanding, it's not a rejection of, let's say, real Pushkin. It's a rejection of a cultural model, which was created in Russia and uh, existed without any notice. Mm. And it's interesting to look at this cultural model. Let's, uh, let's start with Pushkin, which is the obvious example. Uh, because Pushkin in the 20th century uh, was really Russian everything. After the revolution, he was canceled, as good as now in Ukraine, as a representative of the uh, 
feudal circles and servant of monarchy, uh, which is kind of forgotten in Russia. It was a beautiful cartoons in the Soviet magazines in the 1920s uh, depicting Pushkin as a servant of monarchy. And then cultural model changed. And the first stable cultural model was introduced by Stalin, which was extremely interesting model. Uh, because um, uh, in Stalinist model, uh, it had to be kind of international or covering other parts of the Soviet Union. But they made one model and then franchised it for <laughs> all republics. So it was a classical culture. Uh, and uh, Russian Parnassus or Soviet Parnassus was reigned by Pushkin. So Pushkin became a kind of Stalin of culture. Uh, which is not a joke, and in a few moments I will prove to you that uh, he became uh, a kind of John the Baptist of uh, Stalin. So it's a classical model, Pushkin on the top, reigning Parnassus together with Gorky, Mayakovsky, and Tolstoy. Uh, Dostoevsky is excluded. And then we have republics. And in every republic we had to have the same cultural model. So in Ukraine, it was a model led by Shevchenko, the local deity of the great Stalinist culture. And we found a poet, national bard for every Soviet republic. If it was difficult to find a national bard, it could become national epos. And this very strange cultural model, which was absolutely kind of archaic, was based on, let's say, best French 17th century standard. So everybody had to have classicist architecture, everybody had to have opera, everybody had to have classical painting, so we had to go to uh, teach nomadic tribes of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan to paint in the style of Balinese Academy, or to introduce operas for Central Asian Republic. We are talking about classicist operas. So it was a bunch of um, uh, young Jewish composers from Leningrad who were traveling from republic to republic, uh, creating one opera after another. After this, these operas were performed in Moscow, an opera theater in the meantime with the beautiful columns in Palladia style were constructed in Bishkek, Almaty, etc. So that was a model which more or less prevailed after the end of Stalinism. But returning to Pushkin, everybody is forgetting the story of Pushkin monuments. Of course, after 1937, after celebration of um, uh, 100 years since the death of Pushkin in the uh, Soviet Union, this monument started to mushroom all around the Soviet Union. But then, after the Second World War, the borders of the empire extended. So what is happening? 49 GDR, GDR just formed, announced two months later, first monument of Pushkin in Weimar. Uh, 49 Hungary, um, uh, full communist takeover, first monument of Pushkin in Hungary. Romania, 49, the same. And it's interesting that these monuments are put there two years before Stalin monuments are put there. So Pushkin is coming first. He is paving the road because he is marker of Soviet presence. It's very interesting. Uh, we need uh, to understand many things. We are dealing with umbrella definitions which are not keeping. So when we are talking about uh, colonialism and the colonization. Soviet colonialism is a different type of colonialism. We have to specify and to understand it. But because I don't remember that uh, British colonialism were putting in Sudan monuments to Shakespeare. It's, it was not a part of uh, British system. It was not part of French colonial system. But here we have these uh, indicators. And what is very interesting, what is, what is happening with this cultural model? It survived in the fall of Stalinism. It has minimal corrections. Okay, Dostoevsky is added. It's the rehabilitation of Dostoevsky after, during the, from late 50s to the 60s. 
but it remained in more or less the same. All these minor deities of republics, Soviet republics, all these Shevchenkos and, uh, I don't know, Shatar Ustaveli and everybody else, you need to have national bard, cultural model around him, uh, and we have beautiful, let's say, manifestation of this cultural model of Brezhnev period, which is a gigantic painting painted by Ilya Glazunov mm. for the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. If you will have time, just open your computer and look at this masterpiece, because it's the whole hierarchy of this Soviet post-Stalinist model. This model survived, and after the uh, perestroika, it was nicely corrected. Because during the uh, days of Gorbachev, we had the Culture Fund, which was run by Mrs. Gorbachev uh, and academician Lihachev, who, uh, of course, was an important scholar, but uh, absolutely not deprived of Russian nationalistic sentiments. And uh, the story of uh, perestroika in cultural sense was very interesting because, of course, it was great opening and this avalanche of information and knowledge. But part of this information was a return of emigre Russian culture. It was even a special program which was called Names Regained. So everything was returning. And when it was returning, nobody was looking, what is this? Is it Birgit or is it It was a great Russian thinker who returned to us later, even in the form of his mortal belongings. Because as you remember, um, Ilyin remains were reburied in Moscow with uh, to great um, um, uh, applause of Mr. Putin and his entourage. So we embraced all this culture, or Russians embraced all this culture, which was exiled, not making any distinction. Was it good or bad? Uh, was it fascist or democratic? Monarchist uh, or anti-monarchist? All of this was taken, and that created new cultural model, which survived until the beginning of Ukrainian war. Because Putin's model, to put it Okay, maybe it's not fully correct name, but it's a model which prevailed during his reign, is equalization. So everything is good. Our Russian culture is great, 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 great. Pushkin is national bard, but then everything is good. Uh, the parody of the situation came to uh, such levels that, like, literally two months before the war started, they opened in Moscow two monuments. Monument to academician Sakharov and monument to Kalashnikov, the designer of the famous machine gun. Because in their understanding, both of them were representing the greatness of Russia. So you could sell everything. The model had one difference, and substantial difference to Stalinist model. A revolution had to be fully exiled from it. Don't mention the revolution. So Mayakovsky and Gorky lost their um, predominant position uh, in this story. In 2017, when uh, all of Europe was rethinking and dedicating events to the jubileum of the Russian Revolution, Russia remained silent. Uh, in London, I was participating in a minimum five different <laughs> exhibitions and giving lectures here and there from Royal Academy to the um, British Library. Only exhibition which happened in Moscow was exhibition in the former Museum of the Revolution, then Museum of New History, of uh, Contemporary History, which was reduced to two rooms. Uh, describing what the barbarians were Bolsheviks, which of course were difficult to, uh, to argue with, uh, and uh, to some artifacts connected with the killed royal family. One room, nothing. Better be silent. So that model with which Russians arrived to this war. 
And of course, they um, uh, play the interesting role, uh, this model, because first it's fooled educated Russian classes. Because uh, how this class is formed? I think that many of you read uh, the book of Sryoskin, Jewish Century, and he's given in this book beautiful description of, uh, let's say, countries of uh, Soviet intellectuals in the early 30s. So they had two religions, religions of, a religion of communism, which was the main religion, and sub-religion of culture. Because uh, this classicist canon of Soviet culture was universal, more or less, including all culture could be interpreted, the best uh, of the world culture could be interpreted as progressive, and with the duration of time, by, uh, after Stalin's death, this communist religion collapsed, but cultural religion remained. So, these educated classes were very happy with this Putinist model because they mistakenly took it for continuation of the Soviet building, which it was not. It was strong uh, propaganda outlet which was used internationally with um, exhibitions sponsored by Gazprom and with full appropriation of all of Russian culture to which Putinist system had no connection whatsoever as the new demonstration of uh, greatness of Russia, of Russian might, and uh, of Russian cultural orientation. Perfectly fooling, especially Germans, French, etc. So Shukin collection, which was traveling you know, under the Gazprom umbrella, nobody wants to look at uh, René Marx, the grandson of Shukin, who tried to say it's not theirs, it's mine. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that was the system. That was a uh, beautiful alibi of cultivated country. So we are returning to our beloved Putin. So what's happening with Putin under the Putin um, uh, reign? Even on the eve of it, this beautiful Stalinist tradition of sticking Pushkins everywhere it's coming back. It's coming back already on the uh, Yeltsin reign. Yeah, it's kind of neutral sign, cultural sign of Russian presence. In Vienna, you can go and see this beautiful monument to Pushkin, which was donated to Vienna, uh, if I am correct, in um, uh, 2009 by the city of Moscow, which became one of the main donors of this. Uh, monuments. But under Putin, this Pushkinization <laughs> is exploding. And exploding and taking very interesting, uh, no, I'm sorry, in Vienna, it's one, uh, um, uh, I uh, made a mistake, uh, 1999, so it's on the eve of Putin. Under Putin, it's becoming much more interesting because these monuments, they are produced like uh, you know, it's a factory producing the same sculptures. There are three sculptors who are benefiting from this. And my favorite story is 2006, finally, bust of Pushkin in Addis Ababa. With all um, uh, beating drums and military parade on the Pushkin Square. In 2009, when Russian uh, uh, relations with Ethiopia for some short period becoming foggy. Of course, Pushkin is going to Eritrea. And the Eritrean scholars come in with a beautiful foundation for this, explaining that Pushkin couldn't, could not be Ethiopian. He was Eritrean. And we have final proof that he is Eritrean and indifferent to Ethiopia, where Russians gave just a bust of Pushkin. In Ansara is a full-length sculpture. Uh, the same sculpture is already given to uh, Cyprus, uh, Bulgaria, and God knows who. So this production, this market came back. It became another symbol of this uh, uh, Putinist greatness. All of this is happening in a very interesting situation. Can you imagine contemporary world? Who could be taken by the role of the national bard today? We are rethinking whole Western canon, you know, all these 
why dead men are not provoking too much of um, uh, great admiration of the period of 19th century. But they're saving this model, and they're living with this model. Uh, or anyway, they were saving this model until the beginning of the war. Now, changes are coming. And these changes were celebrated by uh, really victory of the most reactional cultural forces in Russia. Uh, my speech was uh, called Everything Quiet on the Culture Front, and it was a parodic reference to a real organization which was formed in Russia in November of the last uh, uh, year, which is called Culture Front of Russia. Uh, it's a product of um, uh, some deputies of Russian Duma, especially of Nikolai Burlyayev, who is a known film actor, who started his career playing in kind of best movies of Tarkovsky, and who is, uh, not to say reactionary, is to say nothing, who basically called for cultural cleansing. And his call realized, because he was demanding the removal of uh, museum directors, uh, he was um, uh, calling to clean the Russian Museum of Malevich's and all this horrible avant-garde, a return to the family values, etc. Now it's an acting organization, uh, which is, of course, sending some, uh, I don't know, musicians to the front to entertain troops, uh, but mainly interested in putting control and introducing censorship. Uh, which is, uh, uh, as you know, in the Russian constitution, it's prohibited, but reality is reality. So we are returning to the best Soviet standards. It's so-called uh, creative councils, which will have representatives of the church, representatives of the army, and which will decide what kind of film to film, uh, what kind of theater plays to perform. So now we will stop this... Um, uh, uh, all-inclusive culture, and, we'll can, uh, and these Russians will return to the situation of uh, much more strange combination of uh, reactionary elements and Soviet elements. They're introducing now uh, Soviet literature, but Soviet literature, which will be reintroduced, of course, not revolutionary, more connected to the Second World War, and that's the model which is forming now. We have to see. I mean, I think you've raised so many things there and kind of traced as a sort of genealogy backwards, but also highlighted the new things that are coming in. And one of the things that I would ask there has to do with this sort of distinction on the one hand between state power, right? A lot of the things you're talking about going and setting up Pushkin statues mm. in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, right, is one thing. But then you also have a cultural class and an intellectual class that's feeding into this, right? And as you're talking... It's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, what it's, is the interrelationship here? Again, because, you know, uh, we have this discussion which is going in Ukraine and in Russia about so-called good Russians. And these good Russians... Um, uh, it's, I don't want to go deep into this question, but I believe that these Russians, which cannot find here their real feeling and understanding of this war, it's such a minority. And their tragedy was that they did not want to notice what was happening around them. They lived in this nice bulb, you know, they were uh, reading uh, journals like NLO, going to the um, you know, High School of Economy, to Shainka, to European University in St. Petersburg, and they did not see the country around them. Now we have this discussion. Uh, could they fight against Putin? Maybe they could not fight against Putin, but they could, as minimum, try to do an effort to react to something which was uh, happening around them. And it's very interesting to look at the real situation. And I found recently a source of my delight. It's an electronic library of uh, articles published in Russian academic journals, peer-reviewed journals, uh, for the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years. And they're coming until this day. 
I'm talking about things which were written by PhDs, professors, summaries of dissertations. And it's extremely interesting reading. I just want to give you some statistics. For example, such interesting topic is so-called Russian vault, uh, which started not now and not in 2014. But I will give you statistics only from 2019. Uh, 249,089 peer-reviewed articles published on this interesting topic. From every professor, from uh, Vladivostok University to Königsberg or Kaliningrad University. These articles are hysterical. The foundation of the uh, Russian world are four great scholars. Spengler, Toynbee, uh, Samuel Huntington. I am very sorry that he did not live to the moment of his greatness in Russia. <laughs> because Russia is civilization, it's not a culture. And to prove it, you have to unearth uh, not very successful daydreaming of Toynbee, and of course to go to such great uh, source. And of course there is a fourth source, is Mr. Zhirinovsky, who put together uh, with this, uh, it's, it's, it's not scholarship, it's full insanity. I think that uh, Sjöld Reich never could dream about on <laughs> such low level. Uh, of this. Uh, another beautiful topic, for example, uh, actual problems of uh, humanities. Special military operation. It's only two years. 31,000 articles. These articles are very telling and very interesting because Canadians recently put on the sanctions um, uh, New School of Economics in Moscow and some other. But they could have to put on the sanctions all of Russian and uh, uh, institutions of higher education, because these people, what they are writing, it's enough for Nuremberg trials. Because these articles are given beautiful advice it's how to denazify Ukraine, that you have to arrest and eliminate activists, that you have to um, um, introduce censorship of press. It's stunning what you can read there. And of course, the idiocy is stunning, because my favorite article on the special uh, military operation is a PhD thesis of the student of the um, uh, uh, University of Management and Security of the President of Russian Federation. So this uh, creative, I have to say, PhD student wrote an article which is called Special Military Operation in Light of Hermeneutics of New Testament. <laughs> Proven. <laughs> I am not joking, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just telling you full truth. Proven that basically New Testament is fully supporting this special operation. Another beautiful topic is Russophobia, which there are many experts in Russophobia. Uh, there are articles by country, Russophobia in Czech Republic, Russophobia in Ukraine, Russophobia in America. You, uh, really can enjoy this, but the best article about Russophobia was a methodological dream of uh, some idiot from, I don't remember, some provincial university, which, uh, and the person decided to go abroad. So he wanted to find foundation for his uh, explanation of Russophobia. And he decided to apply to Carl Jung and came to conclusion that Russophobia is archetype, <laughs> which is a sad news because <laughs> it's very difficult to, to fight with archetypes. And all of this was happening for years mm -hmm. around this intellectual elite sitting in the best universities of Russia. But half of these people were on the um, um, uh, commissions mm -hmm. which were basically, you know, uh, signing this PhD um, <laughs> degrees. They could not fight with Putin, but could they f fight with professor from, I don't know, from University of Kaliningrad? Could they say that it's full crap? Maybe they could, but they 
were not interested because they were living like very nicely in the bulb. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting sign. It's, uh, for me, it's, it's stunning. What you can do with these people in this beautiful new Russia, which um, uh, Russian opposition is promising uh, to construct because uh, they have to, be, to go under prescription. They have to answer for what they did. Uh, it's, it's, it's really scary. I mean, yeah, in a certain sense, you know, some of these folks sitting on these commissions could live in a bubble, but precisely who couldn't live in a bubble are the people at the other ends of the bombs that are falling on Ukrainian cities all over today, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is, I mean, this is, you know, it's this sort of situation where it's absurd and it's funny in many cases, but it also has really real-world consequences. No, but we have real consequences. And we, uh, uh, you know, it's another question with this destruction of, uh, no. and this destruction of cultural property with... Um, I understand fully this Ukrainian feeling about Russians, even if it's ex exaggerated. But we did not have one, one uh, serious cultural figure in Russia who could stand up and yeah. say something. I'm not saying to go to Red Square and to burn yourself. To express concern with it's a, it's a military conflict, we were concerned about the fate of cultural property. None of them. Mm. I'm not talking about like uh, these parody people like Mr. Piotrovsky, the director of the State Hermitage, who announced that he's an imperialist and that imperialism is so good for culture. I'm talking about people like director of the Pushkin Museum, Marina Lashak, who is from Odessa, who did not find uh, courage to say, I'm, I'm saying something. I'm not saying like, none, nobody. It's a big country. Mm. I mean, you know, one of the things that this is making me think about as we're talking about this has to do with a discussion that is really, I think, very compelling um, when we're, t you know, that has arisen in Ukrainian discourse today. And this is about the need for a sort of end to impunity in a certain sense and finding justice specifically. And that applies in many other fields, but it begins to occur to me that it perhaps might also be able to be something talked about in the cultural world as well, right? Because in a certain sense, this sort of genealogy that you're tracing back seems to say, has there been a sort of, in a, a sort of interrogation of that past and a sort of looking for a way? Because one of the things we want, right, a, a presumably is we want a way out of this, right? And yeah, so I yeah, wonder but if it's, that's it's, You know, the, the, the question is that to find the justice. Yeah. You have to look, uh, to look a little bit back. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and we need to understand what we are dealing with. And I think that, uh, again, I address the question of definitions. Uh, we are imprisoned by these general definitions. So what is Russia today? We really have feelings that we are touching the elephant, that we are blind people trying to define this. Because, again, okay, Snyder believes that it's a fascist country. But it's not a fascist country. It's, it's, it's a different model. It's not corresponding to more description of classical fascist state. Uh, Dabrenka is coming with a theory that it's a neo-Stalinist, but it's not neo-Stalinist in classical, in classical form. So we, we have to understand and to define. It. And that's a question to scholars. And uh, the same with um, talking about impunity. Mm -hmm. uh, this problem of Russian imperialism, which of course is provoking a lot of screams about decolonization, which again sometimes are not well grounded. Of course, uh, Russian empire was colonial system, which Russians are trying now fully to deny. If you remember the wo uh, words of Lavrov, that Russia was not stained by blood of colonialism, etc. This idiocy is sold on daily basis to the um, global south uh, and all these dances with uh, Africans in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, which were supported by a chain of exhibitions, which were absolutely hysterical, because I will give you only one example. The State Muse Russian Museum made a big exhibition, which was called Africa in Russian Art, exhibiting garden variety Orientalism, extremely funny 1930s 
uh, children illustration in Bolshevist propaganda books, which were anti-colonial but utterly racist. <laughs> Uh, so this imagery is uh, like absolutely racist. There, and there are no comments. We are showing this. We loved Africa forever and we loved it before and we will love it. Yeah, so this imperialism, what we are dealing with. Uh, Soviet system, it's another form of colonialism which has to be, again, to be investigated. And it's, you cannot apply Said to it. Said doesn't work. And Khomey Baba doesn't work either. We have serious methodological problems. We need to look at it. It was under-researched, underdeveloped. What is this? Is it colonialism? It's imperialism? Uh, it need to be seen mm -hmm. and need to be understood. This need for understanding, I think, is an incredibly important point there. Uh, you know, and one of the ways that you yourself have, done, have made a big contribution in terms of kind of complicating this understanding of the past has to do with your work sort of reclaiming and saying, look, there is something that was happening on Ukrainian territory <coughs> On pe among people who were associated with this land in some way or another that needs to be treated as sui generis in a certain sense, right? And kind of complicating our understanding of that. <coughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how this exhibition came together, how it kind of is rooted in past work you did, and how well, you're thinking about it. This exhibition had very interesting uh, prehistory because I tried to do it since 2016 or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had this road of uh, my ca ca cavalry of rejection. First, it was rejected in Germany because they said that there is no such thing like Ukrainian modernism. It's Russian. And all my attempts to explain that it's not fake because we, we are against nationalism. They said that, but you're talking as a Russian nationalist. No. Then it had to happen in Hungary. It's nearly happened. It was on the, all, already on the way. And at this moment, Orban, it's on the eve of Orban elections came in a uh, full clash with Ukrainians about education law, and uh, they fraud all uh, state uh, programs connected to Ukraine so we could not get insurance. So we took contemporary part to Budapest, but we are not able to take modernist part. And then I was offering it to everybody, and uh, by now it's a very interesting situation. I will, this I will not specify, but some museums which will host this exhibition where those museums which rejected it uh, some years ago and uh, practically and nicely forgot about this rejection, <laughs> uh, making the story. For us, important story, and for me and for my co-curators, was to avoid uh, unneeded nationalization mm -hmm. Uh, because now we have all these beautiful discussions about museum labels and Vosko Inge or Ivazovsky, Ukrainian artist or not, and endless uh, repetition uh, of the mantra that Malevich is Ukrainian artist. Uh, that was not in our interest. We are not um, 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 experts on uh, racial attribution of Malevich. Uh, however, I can say a few words about this too. We, our position was that we have Ukrainian cultural history. We have people who took part in this process. Maybe later they moved to other country, uh, like many of them. Like, you know, one example, uh, 1918 Kiev Cultural League is the best, the biggest Jewish organization of modernist artists. And they are moving in different um, uh, places later, but they left imprint on Ukrainian uh, development of Ukrainian art. They were working with other artists. They were communicating like, okay, Rybak moved to Paris. Lisitsky moved to uh, Russia. But they were there. They played role. And uh, let's say futility of... Uh, uh, let's say nationalization of artists could be proved like by my favorite example, Alexandra Exter, who now became beloved Ukrainian artist, and uh, 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 we even have Marina Tsvitaeva Street in Kiev, renamed uh, after Alexandra Exter. 
but you can open Wikipedia and you will read in Ukrainian Wikipedia the text there is Ukrainian artist. In Russian Wikipedia the tree is Russian artist. But in French Wikipedia you will read the tree is a French artist. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et so we are trying to avoid this. We are trying to tell about uh, Ukrainian culture in development in that period. Of course, it was not perfect exhibition. Of course, we had we did it in a horrible situation. We moved this artwork under the missile barrage, so we coincided with the day of the biggest Russian attack on Ukraine. And when we reached the border. A missile exploded in Poland, uh, leading to immediate closure of Polish border, etc. We could not take works from too many museums. It could be much better. Maybe one day we will make it much better. But our idea was to show the development of Ukrainian culture, uh, not on the basis of nationality of artists, but on the basis of artists who were there, either they were Jewish, Either they were, we have beautiful example by uh, one of the most important Ukrainian artists, Viktor Palmo, was ethnic, Rus ethnic Russians, who came to Ukraine in 24, became like a motor of this development of Ukrainian art, a professor of the Art Institute. Uh, so that's what we try to do. We are, we, are, we are trying to give complicated picture and not to sing the song about the Ukrainian of Malevich. And this exhibition is remarkable in the works that it brings together, and I'm really looking forward to it being here. So we do have some time for questions now, so please feel free to raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, you discussed Pushkin um, in brilliantly, but I, I think, um, could you explain, you know, or tell us how to work with the following, the current use of Pushkin during the military operation. So for instance, like when the Kherson is occupied, yeah, where I was, was there, it's full of the pictures. Moreover, when I was in the torture chambers, there were people like prisoners who were forced to recite uh, not Pushkin, but Lermontov. So there is a clear use of Pushkin in a different way. So how we deal with that, and maybe uh, still I was striking aback by a quote of the soldier who was fighting in Bakhmut, he's anti-fascist, and he was saying that because there was no electricity, he read Dostoevsky there. Because it was just, you know, he couldn't read something else, internet. And was like reading it through the lens of you know, is it really Russian attesting how far I can go? That's how I see what they're doing now, how far I can go in my scene. So can we also, you know, think about rereading? I'm not forcing, I'm asking, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. It's a pleasure to get it from you. Uh, this instrumentalization, which I already mentioned as a term, uh, continuing right now, because uh, Kherson was the best example. And it was not only Pushkin. You remember, all Kherson was covered by huge billboards depicting Russian cultural figures and Russian historical figures with claims that Kherson is Russian city. Everybody who, like Pushkin, spent in this Kherson actually five, five minutes, like passing through it. But this is instrumentalization. This is going, and it's... Uh, Reminded me one scene. I have in my library a kind of a rare book, uh, which is such a book which is um, printed on bad paper called Blood and Borden. It was uh, excerpts from German classics for Deutsche Soldaten uh, distributed on the front lines during the Second World mm -hmm. War. A bit of Goethe, a bit of Schiller, a bit of this and a bit of that. So, uh, what is different with uh, Russian in this story? Because, uh, again, we are uh, understanding that we are seeing like absolutely horrifying uh, approach, which is a fully out of this time. It's a fully falling back even not in the beginning of the 20th century, but in some 19th century model, 
when this culture is becoming evil. Of course, uh, I don't believe that um, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky or Tolstoevsky, or <laughs> name it as, as you wish, uh, is uh, some specific Russian uh, uh, creation. Of course, we have to take it more reasonably as we are approaching any classics in contemporary world. You know, as we are approaching everything, as we are approaching Kimpling, as we are approaching this and that, and it's clear that Bloom canon doesn't work as it worked before. But um, um, uh, I will not uh, accuse Mr. Putin that he is uh, led by Dostoevsky. Uh, and um, uh, I, I will not accuse Dostoevsky that uh, Putin. I will accuse Putin that the, uh, Putin is abstract definition in this case. That they are using it. And this is, as I told you in the beginning, it's the biggest crisis of Russian cultural model in ages. And uh, I am not jealous uh, to those Russians who will be uh, obliged to reconstruct and collect debris of this culture which uh, will remain uh, after this historical explosion on this place. And uh, it's, not, it's not the right time now to, I'm understanding, we cannot do this. We cannot um, uh, do this because of the bombs falling, of the uh, reci reciting Lermontov in the torture uh, chambers. We cannot do it. They're destroying, supporting all of this Russian culture. Thank you. Thank you both of you for this panel. It's uh, not just quiet. It's uh, it's not just a puzzle which we are missing, uh, piece which we are missing, missing from this puzzle. It's a whole huge gap, which whirlpool of this propaganda, and you describe it so amazingly. And uh, I'm an art historian, Ukrainian art historian, mm -hmm. but I had the opportunity to teach in America in, in, in mm -hmm. Indiana courses not on traditional Russian art. I mm. probably was the first in academia who proposed course Ukrainian and Russian, mm -hmm. history of Ukrainian and Russian art. And I know the literature and I know the situation. For instance, it was a book published on Repin. Repin was born in Ukraine, as you know, everybody knows him. Mm. Ukraine was mentioned once in the title of his drawing mm -hmm. of Ukrainian house. That's it. So that's explained, you know, in, in a nutshell, exactly what you were talking about. But to disturb this silence, what shall we do? What is your opinion? Thank yeah, well, I, I can tell you one, one thing, because uh, we have, yeah, if, to talk from Ukrainian point of view, we have many problems too. We, we were not in good shape. By, uh, in, uh, in a uh, cultural research sense by the beginning of this war. Now a new generation is coming. We can pin our hopes on this new generation, but sometimes I am becoming personally a bit annoyed when we are coming and beating the chest and saying that these Russians, Russians, they took everything. And I want to ask, 30 years, where have you been for 30 years of independence? You know, uh, I was just telling today to um, Kate because I'm um, interested in one project with Uzbekistan, which is not an ideal democratic country, but as minimum, they made state catalog of museum holdings online, museum, uh, museums has um, uh, online catalogs, etc., etc. But on the old Soviet, uh, Russian Soviet model, we have t fully to reshape the story. But to, now our task is to show what Ukraine has, to start to do fundamental research, which is absolutely lacking. You know, we need to fill the gap. It's, it's our problem too. I think that, the, that, that it happened, you know, it, it was very difficult to push Russians to uh, recognize something because uh, even reactions, it, it's so funny. Uh, Last Basel Art Fair, 
And of course, uh, Russia's traveling quite well, despite of all these uh, European sanctions. Uh, of course, it's not so many of them, but they came, and then you can see their reactions. And one of these Russian uh, cultural stars saying that it was practically no Russian art, this art fair, unfortunately, except very nice works of um, Alexander Arkhipenko. Arkhipenko spent in Russia like a few months, and never was connected to Russia. Obviously, Ukrainian American artist. But this is, this is the approach, and you're talking about rap, and <laughs> that's even better. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for your insightful remarks. I have one quick question. You mentioned four thinkers that contribute to the hysteria, so Toynbee, Spengler, um, Huntington, and how does Malevich fit, fit into that? No, picture? no, it's not Malevich. Okay, so who was it? Zhirinovsky. How does he fit into the picture? <laughs> yeah, he's a, a great Bad philosopher mistake, anyway. of, the, of, the, of the level of Spengler. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much. That was very enlightening, uh, what you told us. But I have a question. I lived a couple of years in Russia, in Moscow, and later on in Siberia. Russia is not a monoethnic, nor a mononational, nor a monolingual, nor a monocultural state, on the contrary. What is about the others? Uh, many soldiers who died in the first phase of the war came from the minorities, and now they are even recruiting so-called guest workers from Central Asia to the army uh, promising them Russian citizenship. Um, and uh, yes, what about this? It's a very interesting I, question. Am, a good I, question. I met some of these artists, writers uh, uh, from, from other ethnic groups in, in Russia, particularly in Siberia. So and we, we, we have a very interesting cloud because this situation is mishandled by everybody from Ukrainians to the Pope of Rome, who <laughs> nicely made remarks that all oh, these Buryats, well, barbarians who are coming to Ukraine. The Pope of Rome, it's, of course, they came with excuses, etc. Yeah, uh, Ukrainians were not very kosher with this, too starting with these Buryats, etc., except instead of using this situation. I have a very close uh, Kazakh friend, uh, and uh, she is monitoring all this and participating in all these Ukrainian discussions on Facebook. And in that moment, when the Ukrainians uh, beat losing their decolonization grip and uh, starting to describe Russian as a horde, she is correcting them and saying, I'm sorry, we are the horde. V, the golden horde was here in Kazakhstan. Your offensive in your remarks. But of course these people are used as the slaves, but uh, in the same time, you know, that there are um, different uh, human rights organizations strong, like with, especially with Burad, this group. But uh, they are pauperized. They are just thrown in this meat grinder. Yeah, and um, uh, they will force now these guest workers, which are mainly Tajiks, yeah, to, um, to, and they, they will push them there too. Uh, which, of course, is a dangerous for Russian game because uh, at some moment, of course, this uh, disbalance will start and some calamities will start in this. Uh, by the way, in Buryatia, a lot of people run to Mongolia. It's a, a lot of people. It's an immigration that nobody is looking, but Ulan Ude, like, uh, from, um, from Ulan Ude to Ulan Bator, I think the half of city moved, and it's uh, uh, Mongols facing some logistic pro problems, even, of keeping this story. So, uh, no, it's, it's horrible. It's not mono-ethnic, and uh, we will see how they will be able to keep. We are coming to this popular topic, will Russia survive as a um, uh, country or it will um, uh, fall into pieces. Yeah, which is, we, we don't. Yeah. It may not be aware of how many ethnic groups, languages, countries yeah. in Russia. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
Thank you for the conversation. Um, the exhibition you mentioned that you did in Budapest was called Permanent Revolution, if I'm not m mistaken, and uh, yeah. which the title, which is, sounds especially interesting, referring to what you discussed earlier today about the fact that Russia kind of silenced mm -hmm. the Bolshevik or Russian Revolution, or yeah. whatever we call it. Um, can you maybe comment a little bit about this beautiful title of the yeah, show the, you did? The question is that uh, I want, if you permit me, I will make a short tale of two titles. Uh, because that was a part of our contemporary exhibition which arrived without modernist exhibition. And uh, we were talking about state of Ukraine after the independence. Because it really turned into permanent revolution. Orange revolution, Maidan revolution, the revolution on the stones. Uh, so that was referring to the state of um, our country. But then we made another exhibition in Vienna. What is funny for me, it's a return to this uh, um, uh, Kunstakademie, it's a return to the familiar tarf because uh, before the war we made exhibition in the Zemper Depot, which unfortunately had the kind of prophetic name because it was called Between Fire and Fire. And uh, I'm sorry for bad prophecy, but we were talking about fire of Maidan, but it was possible to envision the second fire which was coming. One last question. Yeah. Would, could you elaborate a little bit more on the ongoing destru destruction of cultural her heritage in Ukraine uh, right now? And uh, the role of the world community in that. Russia is, for example, uh, still interacting in the framework of UNESCO, uh, which is uh, supposed to protect cultural heritage. Thank you for the question. I wrote literally a week or two weeks ago an opinion uh, piece in Wall Street Journal uh, just begging to kick a rush of UNESCO. And it was uh, published on the day when in Riyadh they had the opening of uh, um, um, World Heritage Group, which Russia is still in, which is unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable on the um, um, agenda of the group discussion on destruction of Odessa with destructor uh, represented as a member of the expert group. Uh, what's happening is uh, really insane. Uh, we will see more. It's not the end. Uh, you know, uh, with um, Odessa, how Odessa will survive, uh, I don't know. You know about all these last scenes. It's not finishing. It will continue. Uh, sometimes this Russian destruction looks like uh, fully premeditated. Uh, you know, there is no excuse of a uh, missile going astray for five, six meters. Uh, we have some cases like destruction of Skavarada Museum, which you cannot explain uh, through, through the mistake. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Odessa, it's full cynicism. And uh, as usually, we can see that our League of Nations is dysfunctional. Yeah, and international law is dysfunctional. And all the Hague agreements, uh, but it's not the first time. And it was absolutely predictable. I remember in uh, 1989, I was taking part in the Washington Conference. Mm -hmm and I made a little addition to my speech, which was not included into proceedings because it was about Holocaust, it had to be about Holocaust. I uh, remember it uh, one episode from the Yugoslav Wars of Secession. So, when Serbs surrounded Vukovar, Vukovar Museum put a gigantic banner with the side of the Hague Convention. So what you can guess, what was the first building in Vukovar destroyed by the Serb artillery? So it did not work during the Yugoslav war. It uh, doesn't work today. So what is the international law war zone? Where the enforcement instruments? And what is the role of UNESCO? 
And of course, Russia cannot be kicked out of UNESCO. Maybe it can because now Russians become, became very offended that UNESCO uh, was dear to uh, point to them that they cannot cut half of a uh, forest around Bal Baikal Lake. And Mr. Tolstoy, who unfortunately is a relative of Count Leo Tolstoy, and um, uh, deputy of Russian Duma said, who are them to dictate to us what to do? It's a politically charged organization. So maybe they will live by themselves, but there is no way to kick them out because mm -hmm. all the beautiful countries of the global south India, China, and uh, according to the list to the end, of course, never will move their finger. And this is an ongoing thorny problem. You know, and one of the things that I would like to point your attention to is we've had a last minute program edition that we're really, great, really excited about. And there's a chance for us to actually hear more about what's happening on the Ukrainian side of this today and how the Ukrainian cultural scene is acting in the face of the full scale invasion. So that will be here at 5 p.m. today with Lizaveta German and Taras Vidirko. So please also join us for that. But Konstantin, I want to thank you so much for this okay, wide ranging and fascinating picture, if a little depressing. Thank you.